Science advances with new concepts, new ideas. It also advances with new discoveries requiring new data. And advances in sort of acquiring this sort of data usually requires advances in the ability of the tools, the measurement tools, to be more sensitive and more precise. So throughout the last century and before, uh, advances in measurement tools and measurement precision have been key to advances in science. Most of our best tools rely, rely upon uh, uh, our understanding, deep understanding of quantum physics. And a good example of that is where we can measure things most precisely and most accurately is time, the passage of time or frequencies, the inverse of time. These are in a well-known atomic clocks, which are based upon quantum mechanical transitions that exist within atoms and molecules. Uh, atoms, based upon all that we know and all measurements and all theories, each atom of the same type, one to the next, are identical. Every hydrogen atom is identical to every other hydrogen atom. Every rubidium atom to every other rubidium atom, etc. Now, it's always an open scientific question to, to what degree that is true, but all our results to date tell us that this is true. Every proton is the same as every other proton, every electron the same to every other electron, etc. So when we're dealing with quantum mechanical phenomena in individual atoms, like one hydrogen atom, or in collections of hydrogen atoms, for example, or rubidium atoms or cesium atoms, we are dealing with things which can be as perfect as possible, most uh, identical one to the next, and those transitions between quantum mechanical energy levels inside of atoms involve the emission of photons of very specific energies and frequencies. One can think of it as uh, the frequency of the radiation that comes out like the ticking of a clock. And so our clocks, our atomic clocks, are based upon quantum mechanical transitions inside of atoms and the photons that they emit. Sometimes these photons are in long wavelengths in the radio frequency or RF regime. Sometimes they're in intermediate microwave frequencies. Sometimes they're in optical uh, frequencies, high energy transitions, depending upon the particular transitions within the atoms that we choose to use. But they all have these properties of being uh, very well described by quantum mechanics, uh, which is a very well established uh, theory of physics, and we can take advantage of the near uh, perfect nature of, of, of the atoms and the identical nature of one atom of each species, uh, within each species, one to the next. So, atomic clocks are our best tools that exist for measuring anything, and that is time, or the passage of time. There's been tremendous improvement over the last 50 years in terms of our ability to measure time. Currently, it's uh, the accuracy of the best clocks are better than about one part in 10 to the 16, and approaching probably over the next few years, one part in 10 to the 17 or 18. Tremendous improvement in the United States elsewhere work being done. To put that in some perspective, that would be a clock whose time varies by only one second over the entire history of the universe, over 13.7 billion years. So that incredibly good timekeeping uh, precision and accuracy we can exploit to do other science and for practical applications. In terms of science, we can study a lot of basic fundamental physical principles. We can, we can uh, convert other things we want to measure, like magnetic fields or electric fields or temperature or a variety of other basic physical uh, properties of matter or energy into a time measurement, if we're clever, and then compare what we're measuring to these fantastic atomic clocks. We can use these great atomic clocks to make these uh, measurements. So this great advancement over the last many years I've been describing uh, in the performance of atomic clocks and our ability to take these quantum mechanical atomic clocks and relate them to measurements and other things has come because of detailed work and understanding the under underlying quantum physics and then exploiting that and engineering it into devices. In particular, in the last 20 years, there's been great advancement because we've taken advantage of our ability to reduce the temperature of individual atoms, the degree to which they move randomly around by using so-called laser cooling techniques, putting large numbers of atoms, all of the same kind, in, into the same quantum mechanical states, not just their internal states from which they emit their radiation, but also their motional states, sometimes called their external states. That has allowed this great advancement in measurement precision. So I mentioned, in addition to measuring basic fundamental physical chemical properties of matter, some of the practical applications of this, uh, the, the measurement improvement and measurement technology and our realization in our world today is, are things like the GPS system, the global positioning system. Global position system, Earth is a network of satellites, each containing an atomic clock, sending signals to the ground and to various receivers on the ground, but each one keeping time very accurately. So if you want to know where you are 
and each clock knows its time very well, then the time it takes for signals to come to you at any given position on the Earth uh, is given by the ticking rate of the, t uh, the, the absolute time of the clock uh, and then the time it takes for the signals to get to you from the individual clocks on the individual satellites. And there's a delay of the signals arriving to you based upon the separation between the receiver, you're in your car or wherever, and the different satellites. You might be farther away from this satellite than that satellite. So it'll take the signal coming in as a radio frequency signal traveling at the speed of light longer to get to you from that satellite than that satellite and maybe some other satellites. The receiver on board your GPS system knows that all the clocks are keeping perfect time or near perfect time. They're sending out their timestamps. It receives signals coming from the different satellites with different at different shifted times because there's a different time for the signals to come and from that it can compute exactly where it is. Also, you can calculate the motion, how you're, the speed at which you're moving, by the Doppler shift. Uh, the shift of the, uh, of the received frequencies that are of the signals that are coming from the different clocks because that clock on that satellite may be moving towards you, so-called blue shifted, compressing the waves as they come towards you, or red shifted, moving away from you and, and, and expanding the waves. So by looking at these frequency shifts, the compression, blue shift, or expansion, red shift, you can, and, and looking at multiple clocks, you can tell which direction you're moving in and at what speed. All of these things are based upon basic laws of quantum physics and relativity. So our ability over the last century to develop the theories of quantum physics and testing them accurately in the laboratory, relativity as well, has now led to this development of great measurement capability. I mentioned the GPS system as one, but the performance of clocks simpler forms of clocks that exist inside uh, almost all computing devices and uh, networked devices through the internet and other sort of systems around the world creates a network of high performing technology that depends upon measurement. Depends upon the measurement usually getting back to time. So pushing the state of the art in measurement technology emphasizing clocks the most, atomic clocks and based upon quantum properties that also being able to connect that to measurements of other things such as magnetic fields, electric fields, temperature, uh, chemical reaction rates, and things like this allows science to advance and allows technology to advance. And there is a lot of prospect uh, for further improve improvement in the future. So far, our best clocks, though we've been able to take advantage of the internal quantum transitions and take atoms, multiple atoms, and put them into their collective motional ground states, they're typically operating as a bunch of independent os oscillators that we uh, receive the signals from and use to determine what time is. There are, there's the possibility of taking more than one atom and putting them in non-trivial uh, quantum mechanical superpositions uh, and being able to, to improve the performance so that instead of the performance of a clock growing as the square root of the number of individual atoms you have in your clock, it could go as the number of atoms that you have in your clock. These are so-called non-classical states or a particular kind of application of quantum information processing, and people are working on that now. Probably over the next decade or two, these sorts of technologies will be brought into uh, fruition. We'll therefore be able to have even more uh, precise measurement tools for, for probing basic questions in physics, astrophysics, chemistry, and biology, probing the uh, basic questions about high energy physics and the origins of the universe, not only through high energies, but very high precision measurements, and should also lead to greatly advanced technologies for communication, for computation, for navigation, medicine, and other sorts of things. So to summarize, uh, a lot of the advances that we've had in, in basic science and uh, technology over the last century or more have come from an interplay of understanding things at the quantum mechanical level, using those to build devices to be able to measure very well, and then those improved measurement devices feed forward into even better science and technology. For the, our most high performance atomic clocks, one of the main obstacles is that we have to keep the atoms isolated from their environment. And uh, that requires very special apparatus that is large and bulky and does not let them interact with the real world all that directly. So one of the challenges has been to get, maybe you can give up a little performance in the atomic clocks uh, and, and similar measurement devices to put them into more real world friendly instruments. 
something that could be in a phone or on a laptop or in a car or that sort of thing. And so a lot of the work that's been going on in material science and in, uh, it's related to Moore's law, et cetera, scanning down to the nanoscale and understanding uh, interactions in the environment is to take that kind of cutting edge performance that we can get in laboratory systems give away a little performance for a lot more practical applications to get them out in the real world. So that's one kind of obstacle is to, is to keep that interplay going on. As we get performance ever better in the lab, we also want to be able to translate that out into the, the world. It's not just relevant for practical applications. Let's say you have, you're a scientist of a different kind, not a physicist uh, wanting to just push on the measurement performance, but a biologist who's wanting to measure certain pro uh, processes that are going on inside of living systems. You'd love that performance that physicists have today, but you'd like it in something that go, could go into a living system. You'd like to en engineer a quantum probe you know, nanoscale probe to be able to have performance as good as atomic clocks, but inside of a living creature to be able to measure chemical processes or other things that are going on there. So one of the obstacles is to be able to take that performance that we have in laboratory systems and translate it into more user-friendly modalities. Another is one mentioned a little earlier, which is to take advantage of the ability to have quantum correlations between different atoms or different species that are your underlying source of your measurement apparatus and be able to exploit that fully. Theoretically, we know those things would give us advantages. So the theory has been mostly done. The concept is there. It's a realization of it, and therefore it's a, it's a realization challenge, being able to develop the right technologies to realize it. Um, a last one that I'll mention is kind of related to both of those. It's a, it's a way to take the very best things we can measure, usually time, frequency, having to do with the, the ticking rate of uh, transitions in atoms, and making the interface between that capability and other things people want to measure. You know, maybe they want to measure mass, how much something weighs. Maybe they want to measure some detailed property of some material, some chemical reaction, et cetera. Are there ways to translate those other things people care about measuring in science and technology back into a way, a modality that can be measured in terms of time and frequency? The answer is, in many cases, yes. We've been able, scientists and engineers have been able to do that. And there's a further challenge, a further obstacle to being able to have a transducer, something which can take almost all things we want to measure and turn them into a way in which they can be seen as a time or frequency measurement, a clock measurement. As we move forward, better exploiting the laws of physics that we know to make better measurement tools, clocks and other kinds of measurement tools, it will be essential to our advancements in fundamental scientific understanding and technology. If we want to understand uh, the unification of quantum theory, quantum field theory, and general relativity, we can use particle accelerators, we can use astronomical measurements, but another important way to do that is with better measurement tools uh, at the precision, high precision level to see if we can see violations of fundamental symmetries. Uh, if we want to have uh, better ways to understand how to control uh, matter and energy and everything, whether it be for biology or other applications at the, quantum, at the nanoscale, nature is quantum mechanical from the bottom up. Each electron and proton and atom at a time is quantum mechanical, and we're going to need better measurement tools to both understand and control those things. So measurement tools and higher, higher precision measurement tools of all kinds are key to advancing us both in science and technology.